the thing is, I think people really like to feel comfortable. Like they don't like to be out of their comfort zone kind of, right? But sometimes you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Hi, Leo. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. I'm, I've been looking forward to this. So, you know, I have to say, I am so fascinated by your life. I first was introduced to your story, and I think it was 2019, I heard you speak. Okay. And then I read your book, and I've been following you ever since. And I just think you have such an extraordinary story that I was ex really excited to have you on to talk about it. So, world champion kickboxer, Israeli undercover police officer, ultra-endurance cyclist, most people would be extraordinary to accomplish one of those in their lifetime. How have you managed to accomplish all of them? I mean, honestly, it was just kind of by accident, right? I was introduced to like the whole martial arts things because of being bullied in school. Um, I was introduced to the bike from, you know, lieutenant in, in the Israeli army who did um, duathlons, triathlons, you know. Um, I was introduced to ultra endurance cycling as a pro cycling, realizing that I'm better at the longer races. So things kind of uh, just happened as, you know, you try new things, you know, as life goes on and you go, wow, you know, you really like it. And I just, you know, I had a passion for these things that I've done and I just kind of took it to the limits with it. Uh, that's amazing. Um, can we start with your childhood? Because I about the bullying story. Oh, sure. Can you share this, how you, how you got through that and how you found your way into martial arts? Well, I mean, I was bullied in elementary school. Me and my best friend, Matthew, like every lunch hour between like 12 and 12.45, we were chased by a group of eight boys and I called it the Jason gang, right? Um, and, you know, back in my generation, like, you know, we were often told not to tattletale, right? You got to figure things out for yourself. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell, you know, my parents because they kind of were struggling. You know, we had just come to Canada and they were, didn't know English. So, you know, life was not, not so easy. So I got one hour of television back then. Then I had to go outside and play till it got dark, right? So I was looking for my favorite show. And at that time, it was a show called Gilligan's Island, right? So oh, I was yeah. flipping through the channels. I see this Asian man, like small Asian man fighting like 5, 10, 15 people. And I get really excited. And it was Bruce Lee. And he was doing Kung Fu. Oh. And I thought, wow, you know, he fights off 30 people. I only have to fight off eight. So that's when I begged my mother for lessons. I said, I got to learn whatever <laughs> the guy is doing. So that's how she enrolled me in the sport of Taekwondo, which is a Korean form of self-defense. Amazing. Yeah. And, and from that point on, like, did you, did you know right away that this was, like, when you first started Taekwondo, did you know this is, there's something in this for you? Or what was your journey from there? Well, I, for one, I fell in love with it. You know, I mean, it was just something that came really natural to me. And I think, too, because my dad was a champion in the sport of boxing. So we always watch boxing on television and he's, you know, and he would teach me the way they stand, the way they move, the way they punch. So you mix the two together, you get a little bit of a kickboxer, right? You know, yeah. um, so I excelled in, in Taekwondo and I loved the sport. It just came natural to me. You know, by the time I was 12 years old, I was a junior national champion. And mm -hmm. then from there is kind of when I transitioned into kickboxing. A uh, kickboxing coach discovered me and, and he goes, this sport is more suited for you. Amazing. And then, you know, who would you say have been your biggest influences in shaping who you are today? I mean, I think I got a lot of positivity for sure from my parents. Like my dad really installed independence in my sister and I, right? Not to be afraid to do the things that you love and not let anyone tell you what you can or can't do, you know, when you have a passion for something. And my mom, of course, always being supportive. Like she never said no to my sister and I with anything that we wanted to do. So I think having a strong, you know, strong parents with strong influences and, and encouragement really helped us, you know, do the things that we wanted to do in life. So it was a huge bonus. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, what did they think about you getting into fighting and getting into into kickboxing? Well, my dad wasn't thrilled, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> you yeah. know I mean? He wasn't thrilled because he was a boxer. So he knows that it's a, it's a tough sport, right? You know, but I think when he saw my passion for it, how much I loved it. And like, you know, I was really adamant about always going to, you know, my Taekwondo lessons and I would train in the morning. I would train after school. I would train in the evening. Um, so then he started to see, you know, how serious I was and he kind of, you know, came on board with helping me kind of train, getting boxing coaches and, and building me a gym in the back. Right. So it was, um, yeah, it was, it wasn't, it was kind of rough waters in the beginning, but it, be it became smoother as the, as the career progressed. Great. And 
what was that journey like for you in terms of becoming a world champion? What was what did you have to do in order to get to that level? Well, I mean, it's funny because my kickboxing coach, you know, when he said to me, you know, if you want to do this sport, then he gave me conditions. Remember, I'm a 13 year old teenager, and he goes, no smoking, yeah. no drinking, no drugs, no friends, no swear. Train seven days <laughs> a week, train twice a day, right? You know, and you know, when you're a kid, you have parties and friends and good times. But I knew at that age, you know, in order to be the best in the world, I, you know, had a lot of sacrifices, and you know, I didn't train seven days a week twice a day. I trained seven days a week three times a day. Um, and I realized that, you know, you really have to laser in giving yourself 110%. And at the age of 17 years old, as Alan Chang, my coach, predicted, I was the undefeated champion of the world. Amazing. And what an incredible work ethic to have at such a young age. Like I think, you know, I know many adults who struggle with those kinds of sacrifices and doing what they need to do to get to where they want. And so to have that at such a young age is so incredible. Well, I mean, when you're going, like, I think any athlete reaching for a gold medal or world championship or whatever, they're just com com completely consumed with it, right? You know, and you do whatever it takes to get there. And so for me, I was, I was my passion and my goal, and I was willing to do whatever it took to, to become the best kickboxer in the world. Oh, at any point during that, did you ever feel like you were missing out or did you ever regret your choices or did you just know this is what you wanted? No, I think because um, like good times, friends, whatever, they're always going to be around, but unique and yeah. special opportunities won't. And I knew that, right? You know, I mean, it's better to do those things anyways when you're an adult because your parents won't tell you yeah. what to do, right? You know, For sure. and to be honest with you, I wasn't a big, huge social butterfly. I wasn't, you know... Um, with big, you know, I didn't like to go to parties. I didn't have a, a heck of a lot of friends. I usually had one good friend or two friends. So it was more kind of a introvert, a little bit quiet, shy, you know. So for me, yeah. this was it, this was a good thing, you know. And I said I was just, I was just consumed with this. I was obsessed with it, and so that was my life at yeah. that time. And then, how did you go from so you were world kickboxing champion, and then into the Israeli undercover police service? What? How did you get there? Well, that's that's way back. You have to go back up a little bit. Oh, I mean, okay. I knew what I wanted to do when I was seven years old, right? You know, um, but I never told anyone. I wanted. I knew that um, when I graduate from high school, I'd go back to Israel and I joined the IDF, which is the Israel Defense Force, mm. and hoping from there I would be. It would. I would transition into some security, you know, agency, you know, which I did. I worked for the Belush. So that's kind of what was my goal from from way back when. And you'd think too, as a child, like you have these big dreams that that you know that dream would kind of diminish, but it just got stronger as I got older. So after I won the world championships, I did, I actually went back to Israel. Wow. And then, and what was that part of your life like for you? It was intense, to say the least. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. I was put in a special unit um, in the military because they kind of scope you out kind of what you're good at, what you're not. And there was 300 of us recruits and then they kind of put you through a series of mental and physical um, exercises and we were cut down to like 50 and then cut down to 10 and then I was cut down to two and I was one of the two that was placed in a, a base called base eight Bajmone, and it's a base where um, I trained elite units and I was the first female instructor to train the commando and I my unit was called the unit of Krav Maga which you might heard I mean, maybe many North Americans have heard that term Krav Maga yeah it's, um, it's it's a, it's a Hebrew term. Like Krav means fight and Maga means hand, so lethal hand combat. And that form right. of self-defense is actually designed for soldiers. Let's say if they're ammunition jams, how to use a rock, a stick, a stone in a very lethal way. So that's kind of the basis of that kind of self-defense. Then from there, you ended up in endurance cycling. The how, So how did you get to that point? I well, guess it's amazing. We've had all these different... Yeah. Well, I mean, in the military, things. I was, I mean, I always had to be very fit. So one of the lieutenants there saw that, you know, when I wasn't training troops, I was training myself. And he also noticed that I also commuted to the base with my bike because with the military salary, yeah. I had a car, but I had no money to buy gas. So I just <laughs> so use my bike, right? So he asked me, you know, if I wanted to go for a ride. And this lieutenant was also Israel's national champion in the sport of triathlon. So we went on this ride. I didn't want to say I didn't really want to go, but I didn't want to be rude and say no. So we went on this ride and it just, that's basically where I was born. I fell in love with the sport. He started coaching me. And, um, and then at that time, I mean, 
it, it wasn't in my head that this is what I wanted to do, that this was really what my calling was. But I continued racing duathlons because there was no pro women's racing in the Middle East at that time. Um, okay. And I was winning almost everything, beating men. And it wasn't so much the running part. It was the cycling part. That's where the obsession was, right? Um, hey. So, yeah, that kind of just stuck with me until I was like 30 after you know, the Belouche, after working for yeah. a spying agency, that I came back to North America. Wow. You know, in reading your book, one of the things that stood out to me so much was that you keep going way beyond the point that most people would quit. And and it, what is it that keeps you going and keeps that drive? I mean, I think I have a goal in mind, right? I think when we want to do something, you have to think what your what your finish line is kind of, right? Like where you want to get to. And kind of the sacrifices that it's going to take for you to get to that point, right? And I knew that when I put my mind to it, I'm going to get there no matter how long it takes, right? Like, for example, um, I also kind of preach this that, you know, even if you find a passion that you're not necessarily gifted in, right? Because there's a gift we all have. It's called the gift of work. Because in pro racing, I wasn't right. gifted in the sport. You know, I left the Middle East to go into professional racing thinking that I'm going to, you know, explode because I was so good back, you know, back in the Middle East. It's because I was, a, you know, a big fish in a small pond. I come to North America and I'm a shrimp in an ocean. And I'd go into these right. races coming in so, so last that I wouldn't even know where the finish line was because everybody would be finished and they'd leave, right? I mean, that's oh. how I started my career. Like when you talk about rock bottom, right? You know, but yeah. I had such a, you know, determination and a passion um, that, you know, failure for me wasn't an option. And it took me eight years to reach that point of racing that I wanted to reach for me and becoming one of the best cyclists in the world. Yeah. So sometimes it is, it's going to be sacrifice. And, and for me, it was eight years, you know, coming, you know, at 30 years old, finally at the age of 38, you know, you know, winning these national championships, winning these huge stage races, um, you know, racing up getting offers for big teams but it took wow. that long to get to that point point. and did you always know that if you kept going at it you would get there or was there did you ever have any doubts about that I mean, you, you're, you're going to have your doubts for sure, right? I mean, it's a roller coaster ride when you're, you know, but I mean, every time you get knocked down, you got to get back up, right? Because every yeah. time you get, you know, you get back up, it's harder to knock you down, you know? And I think, too, it's a lot of the mental part of it as well, right? Like for me, it was also kind of not really putting in the work. I knew that I had to work twice as hard as my competitors, right? And also believing that I could do it. Because a lot of people were saying, yeah. you know what, when I was like 30, like 35, saying, you know, you might want to think about, doing something else before you end up living in a cardboard box because, you know, <laughs> right. I so resting, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, but I just, you know, I just made up my mind saying, no, this is going to happen. And I think the trigger point for me was when I heard somebody kind of criticize, I, they insulted kind of my ability as a cyclist and it was humiliating. I was completely like a, uh, a director had said that I couldn't climb more, excuse my language, couldn't climb more shit. Right. You know, and that just stuck with me. And, and then I just thought, you know what, I'm going to show them. Right. In the following year, uh -huh. you know, I, I basically moved from Vancouver to Vernon. It's more hilly here. I hired a climbing coach. I came back about 10 pounds lighter and I started climbing those mountains like never before mm -hmm. setting new records. And then all of a sudden at 38, I'm getting all these contracts. Right. You know, yeah. so it, it was a tough, but I like to use that example too, because with other mm -hmm. things I did, it kind of came natural, more natural to me. Right. And I succeeded, not that I didn't work hard, but this was a real eye opener saying, you know what? Wow. You know, you really aren't yeah. good at this, but it's a good, you know, a good lesson too, and message for other people that you don't have to be, you know, don't have to have a gift in anything you choose to do in order to excel. I love that. I love that. We can, we can work at it, right? And absolutely. Can, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. So why ultra endurance cycling? Because I was, I was reading up on some of it. I'm like, this sounds crazy. Why? <laughs> why do you do it? Because it is crazy. <laughs> I mean, as a pro racer, I raced with the national team for about six years and we do big races. Like, you know, the Tour de France, mm -hmm. many of your viewers will understand that race. There is a woman's version of it. It's called Le Grand Bouquel. It's the same kind okay. of idea, 17 stages, you know. And with these bigger races, I noticed too that I was, I excelled in big, in large, longer races. I got better as the race progressed rather than getting tired. I recovered really well. And on top of that, in the military, we had a lot of um, exercises being really sleep deprived, right? You know, we oh, yeah. Yeah. Like 30 minutes a night, sometimes not not anything for two days. And then they make us do these grueling. Yeah. So you mix those together and you get a really good ultra endurance racer. And also I have yeah. the ability to push myself beyond my limits. So the combination of those three makes me a pretty good ultra endurance racer, I right? Mean I would bet, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the sleep deprivation is the biggest one, right? Because, you know, if you can't, 
if you if you're this person that really needs your eight hours, then that then it's not it's not going to be for you. You're gonna have a real hard time with the sport. Yeah, that would be me. There's no way I'm not sacrificing sleep <laughs> for anything. Can you can you give us a little bit of insight into what the training for something like that is like? Like what to what for that looks like? America, you yeah. Mean for the the mother of all races, uh, it's insane. I mean, for one, it's a, it's a one-year process with the, just with the logistics because I also have a crew with me. So I have a crew of nine people. So I have a doctor, a massage therapist, a mechanic, you know, a navigator. And there, I have two people always following me. And then the rest are okay. They're doing 12-hour rotations, right, you know. Okay. And I have a earpiece. I'm connected to the people in the back. They're telling them, giving me kind of navigation stuff. They give me a toothbrush to brush my teeth, food, whatnot. Wow. Right? So, I mean, it's hard because when the race starts, you go the first 40 hours, you're not getting off the bike. And then you'll start your sleep cycle. Because remember, it's a 3,000 mile, which is about 5,000 uh-huh. kgs under, nonstop race. And you only got 12 days to do it. So you have to be really systematic of how much, you know, oh. time you're going to spend off the bike. So most of your time is going to be on the bike. And then your sleep cycles oh. are going to start kind of in day two. And it'll be anywhere between three hours tops to 90 minutes to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely incredible. I just, I can't even imagine. I'm good with 30 minutes on my Peloton and I'm, yes. <laughs> I'm happy with that. I'm good with that. <laughs> I think most people are too, you know, but yeah. it's funny, even, and, and the thing that you have to navigate to as a rider is the hallucinations. Cause when your brain oh, yeah. gets really tired and, and, you know, things get kind of wonky, right. You know, like big, those big boulders you see them crossing the mountain passes, they're actually moving. They become monsters. The children crossing signs, mm-hmm. the kids are actually crossing, you know, um, at one time I hallucinated that a black leopard had, you know, was leaping towards me. So I veered over to the other side of the road. So, it, you know, it's really, yeah. uh, kind of a fine line when the crew has to tell you, you know what, we have to pull you over. You need to sleep for eight or 10 minutes or whatever, which when you do to take those kind of cat naps or power naps, when you, you come out of that, you felt like you just slept 12 hours. Right. So, yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of, like I said, a lot, there's a lot of logistics in regards to this type of race and the, your crew is your, is your brains, right? Like they're, they're, it's like they have the remote control and they control everything that you do because a lot of times, you know what, three o'clock in the morning, you'll be riding your bike going, what am I doing on this bike? You don't even know what you're doing. Right. You know, so they kind of have to monitor all that stuff. And so it it becomes quite, you know, like I said, it's like a logistical nightmare sometimes. Right. How do you you mentally train yourself for a race like that? Well, I mean, a lot of it's to do with the training that I do prior to the race. Right. I try to replicate as much as I can, the stuff that I'm going to go through, like I'll do a lot of times, uh, 24 hour rides, you know, um, and it's hard yeah. when you're not in that race environment and living in Canada, you know, I have to sometimes hit the trainer, which is an indoor, um, device that you put your bike on. It's like a Peloton kind of, but you, you yeah. use our own bike, right? Just so your audience knows what I'm talking about. So yeah. I'll have to sit on that sometimes for 12 to 15 hours. And I'm just staring at a wall because I do not listen to music. I do not listen, uh, to the radio or whatever. Um, don't watch television. I don't, you know, nothing. I just focus on what I'm doing. And sometimes it's just staring at a blank wall. <laughs> so you kind of got to get into this autopilot mode and, and just sit and stay there. And it can be really difficult, right? So I purposely yeah. try to make the training almost harder than what the race is going to feel like. Absolutely amazing. It sounds like it's very, very disciplined. Like you have a lot of discipline going yeah, into it. It's, it's very disciplined. Like I said, I mean... I think the percentage of first time Ram finishes, I think is like 10% or 12% because I don't think people realize the difficulty because you have to also qualify for this race. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to go and do Ram because for one, it's going to cost you anywhere between 25 to $50,000, right? You know, Um, unless you're fully sponsored, like I'm fortunate to have some really good sponsors that kind of just kind of piggybacked, you know, from my pro racing into ultra endurance racing, but don't forget your you're got nine crew that you got to feed house transportation you know the the entry fee itself and then the gas the rv the two follow cars so you add all that up that's yeah. something you don't take a mortgage on <laughs> it's yeah. like you're on your house <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. so you don't want to do spend all that money and then go into this race and then well you know you're finished in day two or day three and don't forget too like the, there you got to think about mother nature i mean in 2021 right. when i won the overall it was 55 celsius going through the desert 
And that sheet, mm. remember that? I remember the sheet dome in uh, 2021, and it followed oh, yeah. us right across the country. Like even in Kansas, I, w- I had burned right through my jersey when you know I went to change whatever clothes. I had welts on my back. And one of my crew members said, did you ride, you know, shirtless? I go, no, you know, I mean, it was just, just blistered. It's crazy. So the elements, you know, and then, and then in 2011, it was rain and wind and, and hail the size of like little golf balls. And then we're getting bruised on the side of my face. Right. So, I mean, it's just so many things that can happen. And then the saddle sores on top of it, it's the sores you get from seating. Oh my God. It's just, it's just so much fun. (laughs) That's exactly what I was thinking. It just sounds so fun. No wonder. How do you do this? I, oh, it's crazy, you know. And then you yeah. hate it, but then when you finish, you go never do it again. And then two months later, you sign up again. <laughs> how, like, so I mean, my biggest concern is how do you eat while you're going through that? Like, when you're you're just eating on the bike, and and for okay. me, I'm I'm vegan, so um, you yeah. know, my food is quite limited. But I I like to keep my um my diet as liquid as possible, just so the stomach doesn't have to have to digest. You know, so a lot of fruits, um, fresh fruit, watermelon, apples, grapes, bananas. A lot of smoothies are really good. Um. Uh, I'm sponsored by Hammer, so something called Perpetuum, which is a it's a soy oh, yeah. kind of um, blend of protein and carbohydrates. So it's really an experiment too, because that's also training. You have to train your guts kind of to be able to take this, right? Because it's not easy when you're when it's 50 degrees outside or 110 Fahrenheit or whatever it may be, and you have to eat, but you can't, right? So you have to be strategic on on liquid diet or liquid food or something, because you got to think about how many calories you're actually burning. Like I'm 20. 25 pounds lighter when I hit the other side of the country. I bet. Yeah. So it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. It's a yeah. good weight loss program, but I don't recommend it. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I mean, you can eat whatever you want when you get to the other side, but yeah. you'll suffer for 10 days or 12 days to get there. <laughs> for sure. When you do finish the race, like what, how do you celebrate after? What are what do you do afterwards? There's a big banquet after, right? The the race, um, they have a big banquet after, and you know, it's all, everyone comes and they celebrate, and it's just, but you're just um, you're so sleep deprived and so tired that it doesn't really kick in till a couple of weeks after, right? You know, because yeah. you're also not sleeping properly because you've just you know for the last ten days you've been you've barely slept, like maybe in a twenty four hour period, maybe ninety minutes, like I said, to tops three hours, right? Um. And in my case, a lot of times for the second half of the race, we'll cut my sleep to like 30 minutes, right? You know, and take a, a, right. couple, a couple of cat naps, right? So, but of course, I mean, you're, it's a high, it's a natural high, right? You know, you're yeah. you've just in, done something incredibly crazy, right? You know, that most sure. people couldn't do. So it's, yeah, it's definitely, there, there's something about, it's in the, almost like an addiction, right? You know, that you want to go come back for more, right? That's why this year I've actually signed up for something even more challenging called Trans America, which is, um, it's a 4,200 mile race, 7,000 kilometers, but it's unsupported. So I can't have any help. Yeah. So it's a different type of training, different kind of logistics, right? You know, different types of thoughts. So I actually hired a coach to help me out with this, right? Um, Greg from Trimax Coaching, uh, because he, you know, he specializes in this kind of thing. This is the first for me. And I remember the organizer of another bikepacking kind of race invited me to one of his races. And I said, I would never do that in a million years. I can't imagine (laughs) without a crew, having to do everything by myself, right? So you have to think about, I mean, I have to be responsible for my hotel, my Mm -hmm. mechanics, my sleep, my food, you know, um, everything is on on the rider, right? So it's, uh, I'm excited, but it's scary at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that you f- do find it scary. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, well, it's real, scary, right? You know, like it's a, you're nervous, kind of scary, right? But I think it's good to do new challenges. Like I've done Ram four times, and I just think oh, to do God. something a little bit different, a little bit harder. You know, um, yeah, it's see how tough I really am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and how like when you do have that that nervousness, that fear coming up, what are some things that you do to overcome it? How do you deal with it? 
Well, I mean, like for this, I guess I'm, I'm not experienced with, with, um, self-supported races. So I'm going to do a practice race in three okay. weeks. I'm going to go out and just do like a 600 kilometer loop. And then three weeks later, I'll do a 1200 kilometer loop just to kind of test the bike and, and how, you know, how fast I can ride. And like right now I'm actually training with weight. So I am wearing a 15 pound, like a, it's a weighted vest and I have my bike fully loaded to get the feeling. Cause it's a lot different when you're carrying an extra 40 pounds. Right. Right. Um, I mean, training like that. Um, and just, yeah. So just kind of get the feel of what it's like to be out there, you know, and also, you know, say you're stuck. I mean, I might have to sleep under a tree in my bivy bag, which is just like an emergency oh. knapsack. It's a, one little nap that you can fit in the palm of your hand, right? It's like, you know, those, um, those like, uh, blankets you get after a marathon, they're kind of so, oh, yeah. yeah, it's the same yeah. idea, but it's just like an, it's like a bag. So it's just things like that. But I'm speaking with a lot of um, racers who've done the race and, and two of the guys who actually won it. So I actually have a meeting tonight with one of them and I have a list of okay. questions. And so, yeah, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Great. Great. What are, do you have any suggestions for people listening to this for how they can improve their own mental toughness? Because I think if we could, if we could all have like 1% of your mental strength, we would, we would skyrocket. So any suggestions for how we can develop that? I mean, I think it's the thing is, I think people really like to feel comfortable. Like they don't like to be out of their comfort zone kind of, right? But sometimes you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And yeah. trying new things. See, the biggest impact I think was my grandmother, right? Like for one, life is really short, you know? She, um, she had a really bad cancer, really quick, uh, progressive cancer. And her last words to me while she was sitting on her deathbed is, you never want to say the words I wish or what if, right? You know, and that really stuck right. with me because there's so many things she still wanted to do. She was fairly young, like in her early 70s when she passed, right? Um, yeah. So I think we have to think about that, you know, that life goes by so quickly, you know what I mean? And so yes. what if we fail? That's, you know, failure is part of success, right? It's how we learn. That's how we progress. And if you listen to a lot of people who are successful, you know, listen to their backstory. Like, it doesn't matter that I've won race across America, or I did this or somebody, whatever. It's what it took to get there. You know what I mean? Like, you know, hitting rock bottom, coming yeah. out of that again. Like, you know, even the crash I had in 2006, where I landed right. on my face at 80 kilometers an hour, mm -hmm. doctors telling me that I'd never walk, definitely never race again, you know, let mm -hmm. alone walk. Right. So, I think is not being afraid and trying those things because you really like discover things about yourself that you've never known, right? You can't sit there yeah. and, and wait for things to happen. You have to make it yourself, right? And I think once you take that first step, that second step will get easier. That th third step will get even easier. You just got to keep moving forward. So speaking of your, your crash in 2006, when I was reading about it. It like, how did you, how did you get through that time? Because it, a lot of people, I think, would give up there. Like they would listen to the doctors and go, okay, this is the end for me. How did you know to keep going and what was going on inside of you? Well, for one, I mean, at that point, that was after I kind of reached that. I was in my 30, 30 A when I was getting all these contracts, right? I went to a race and I ended up, somebody kind of leaned into me at 80 kilometers an hour, crashed on my face. And I ended up in the trauma unit in Bend, Oregon. And I remember sitting there when I woke up and doctors saying, you know, all, you know, this is the only thing they said that I might be able to do is swim, which I don't, I don't even like swimming. Right now. <laughs> so you know, I said to myself, you know, I worked too damn hard, you know, to take that diagnosis. Right. And I said to myself, mm -hmm. I don't care how long it takes the pain I'm going to go through. I'm going to get back on that bike. I'm going to race again. I'm going to come back even stronger than I did before all this craziness happened. And I didn't yeah. procrastinate. As soon as I made that kind of declaration, that's what I was going to do. I started my recovery right there. And then and the only thing I could do at that time, honestly, was contract my abs that was it but every day I did something today that I couldn't do the day before you know and being in that positive mode as hokey pokey as this may sound I could feel my body starting to bind you know and yeah. I just worked my butt off I seriously didn't it wasn't so much the physical part I knew I could cut back on it was more the mental part of you know the flashbacks of the crash right because you know in pro racing oh, yeah. everyone's riding really close together if I'm doing this I'm kind of touching the person beside me so it was a it was a lot of work a lot of mental work too with my coach but I did and in less than a year I was back you know back on the bike and ready to rock and roll you That's know amazing so, yeah absolutely amazing how what do you do to relax? Do what you I relax? Do? Yeah. I, you know, actually, I'm, 
I, I have two wonderful dogs. I have a French bulldog and another bully mix. And to oh, me, nice. it's going, like I live in Vernon. So this is like trail central here, right? So I like uh-huh. to, every morning I take them, we go for about an hour and a half to two hours, just go to nature, you know, and then the evening time I go with them too. I love to spend, I'm really close with my family. Like I'm, my mom's my best friend, right? So I, they're in Vancouver, so I'll go there quite often. Um, and I think too, the thing is it's good, important to ground yourself, right? You know, I also like to turn my phone off. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh-huh. To, even when I train or whatever, I turn the damn thing off because, you know, beep, 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 you're, you're too tempted, right? Or when I'm walking or something, I'm not that important. People can wait, right? You know, <laughs> so I think too, is just um, learning to be by yourself with yourself without any stimulation. I think it really grounds you, right? And kind of recharges you. So for me, that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's, you know, something that I'm definitely appreciating more and more is turning off the phone and leaving yes. it behind and yeah. it creates so much mental space and clarity when we do that. Exactly, exactly. And it's important. I think you you need to do that, right? When we're so attached to the phone, like I, it's funny, the other, the other um, interview that I had, I remember I was in Vancouver with my sister and we were just walking down Granville Street and there was about 15 people at the bus station and every single person was looking at their phone. Like it was just, is this what, you know, where's the human connection, right? You know, or yeah. even with our young kids, right? It's just a little bit too much screen time for, I mean, maybe I'm a little old fashioned, I don't know. But what about the days when we were young, we went out there, we were played and, you know, we, yeah. we you know, you used your mind, you were creative, you had to think of games, right? You know, and I think that yeah. needs, just a tiny bit has to come back to this generation, right? Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, I have some rapid fire questions if you're, if you're up for okay. it. <laughs> okay. No limits. That's my book. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's a great one. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. My favorite book. Uh, any, any life story, any biography. I love them all. It's so interesting uh, to learn about other people. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I agree. Favorite food. I like fruit. I'm a f- fruitarian. <laughs> <laughs> three things you take with you to a deserted island three things i would take I'd take my dogs with me yes. i take my bike with me and probably my mother <laughs> oh nice that's really sweet i was hoping you would say your bike i'm like no. take your bike. <laughs> yeah. take your bike who's a celebrity that you would like to have dinner with dead or alive honestly i honestly just rather have a good dinner with my friends and family that would oh i like that trust me more than any i mean i'm just not that you know i don't dote yeah. on anyone I'm, I'm impressed with a lot of people what people have done and whatever but to me friends and family would be i'd rather spend any day with them with somebody i don't know i love that answer yeah, and you. your go-to karaoke song <laughs> i love adele so anything with adele is good right yes yes Oh, really? Yeah, is it rolling right. in the deep, or what is it called, or what's it called? That's why I can't rolling remember. in the deep. Is rolling it? in the deep, yeah. Yes, it's, it's so good. Cool. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, great song. Yeah. So, what's coming up next for you? You talked about the race that you're training for. Is there anything else that you have in the works? Yes, actually, um, I the No Limits documentary is um, was picked up by JRB Entertainment in Los Angeles. So we're just mm-hmm. in the point right now of completing the contract with them. So hopefully that would be successful. Um, and then hopefully a, um, a new version of the No Limits book as well. So a couple wow. of things going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's exciting. That sounds yeah. very exciting. Yeah. And any final thoughts that you'd like to leave the audience with? No, I mean, just go out there and live life and don't be afraid. Right. You know what I mean? Live every day like it's your last. No limits. No limits. Exactly. Thank you so much. I'm going to put the links for your website, your book you. uh, in the show notes. Is there anywhere else you would like people to find you online or to connect um, with you? Some website, Facebook, uh, yeah, any social media outlet, you'll find me there. Yeah. Perfect. I'll put them all in the show notes. Great. Nice and simple. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate this. Thanks for having me.